Good morning, everyone. I am Whitney Rose, one of our substitute teaching leaders for our class. Happy Snow Week. I'm so glad everyone is here with us this week. Um, I don't have any announcements for us, but um, I did really think this week when we got all of the snow, how thankful I am for the technology that we have to use and that this snowstorm didn't even put a wrinkle in our BSF plans, um, but we were able to just continue on because we're old pros at using Zoom by this point in the year. So very thankful that God has given us technology to use so that we can continue meeting no matter what circumstances arise. So let's pray before we begin our lecture on Genesis 29. Father, we just thank you for the technology that you have given us. Thank you that during this year of separation, you have allowed us to continue to have connection um, around your word. Um, I'm so grateful for all of our faithful leaders willing to um, learn new technology and also our class members who have been so flexible and so willing to try something different in order to continue to learn more about you and to connect with other women who are seeking you in their lives. God, we just worship you as an all-wise God who is involved in every aspect of our lives and loves us so very much. And so I pray right now that you would just um, let my words be your words and that you would speak directly to the women through this message on chapter 29 of Genesis. In your name we pray. Amen. The beauty of a pearl is truly undeniable. But when you consider how a pearl is made, it's almost unbelievable to think that what began as a tiny irritant could become a near perfect sphere of lustrous white. I'm sure you're all vaguely familiar with the process. An oyster, which is composed of two shells, contains a protective layer on each shell that covers and protects the organs of the oyster. At some point in time, an irritant is introduced to the oyster. The irritant might be a grain of sand or a particle of food. The oyster's response to this irritant is to produce a mineral substance to cover the invader. The oyster produces layer upon layer of this substance, eventually producing an iridescent gem. This process can take years. I find it interesting that the response of the oyster is not to rid itself of the irritant, but instead to transform the irritant into something beautiful. As I read Genesis 29 this week, I saw the same principle applied to the suffering we encounter in our lives. Our natural reaction when going through suffering is to get out as soon as possible. But God uses that suffering in our lives to sanctify us. With each episode of suffering, he is building a layer of character in our life. God is using every circumstance that we encounter to teach us, grow us, and transform us into beautiful pearls. Our aim today is that in his wisdom, God guides and grows believers for his good purposes. And we're going to look at um, this chapter in three divisions. Let me pull those up for you. God's providential wisdom, that will be verses 1 through 14. Then God's transforming wisdom, and that will be verses 15 through 30. And then God's compassionate wisdom, and that will be verses 31 through 35. Throughout our passage this week, we are confronted with suffering. In order to have a solid biblical understanding, let me take a minute to define and explain the doctrine of suffering to you. The definition of suffering is the experience of physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual pain and or distress. We experience illness, death, anxiety, loneliness, heartache, and financial hardship 
in ourselves and in those we love and care about on a daily basis. Suffering entered the world as a consequence of the fall of Adam and Eve and is a painful reality for all people until Revelation 21.4 is fulfilled. Suffering can cause us to question our faith, lose hope, and even question the character of God. It's imperative that we view suffering through the lens of scripture rather than the lens of emotion in order to better understand the character of God in the midst of our suffering. What have we learned about who God is so far in our study of Genesis? Well, we know that God is almighty, sovereign, all-knowing, wise, personal, he is a redeemer, and he is good. God knows everything. He knows the what, the what if, the what could have been, and the what will be. And God doesn't just have knowledge. He knows how to perfectly apply that knowledge, which is called wisdom. Through studying scripture, we learn that God always knows the right thing to do in every circumstance in order to keep his promises and accomplish his good purposes. Having a high view of God's character increases our trust in him as we endure suffering. With that knowledge, let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 29 to look for God's providential wisdom. Jacob left Bethel after a mountaintop experience. He had a personal encounter with the living God. His faith was renewed and he set out with a promise from God himself. God promised Jacob in Genesis 28 verse 15 to be with him, to protect and to guide him throughout the remainder of his journey. Now, some may hear this promise and think, well, if God says he's with you and he's watching over you, that surely means nothing bad is going to happen to you. But what God really said in that moment was, no matter what happens to you, don't forget, I am with you. I'm watching over you and you can trust my wisdom. God told Jacob to trust him to accomplish his good purposes, no matter what circumstances he encountered. As Jacob continued, we see God's providential wisdom led him to a well. Jacob's mission was to find Laban's family. He didn't have an iPhone with GPS, maps, and a Find My Friends app. And on top of that, people lived a nomadic lifestyle. And even though they typically remained in a region, they didn't have a permanent address. How would Jacob find his family without even knowing where they are? That seems like an impossible task for those of us in the 21st century. But in Jacob's time, there was a logical method to accomplish this task. If you wanted to find somebody, you took the well-traveled path to the nearest well in the region because everybody needed water eventually. So that is exactly what Jacob did. Jacob arrived at a well that was covered by a large stone. Some shepherds with their flocks were resting near the well while they waited for all the other shepherds to arrive. As Jacob approached the scene, I imagine he was thinking back on the stories of how Abraham's servant had found his own mother at a well. Jacob knew that it was his duty to find a wife from his mother's family on this journey and it must have sparked a little hope once he recognized the fam familiarity of the scene. Jacob approached one of the shepherds and asked if he knew Laban. He did, and in fact, his daughter was approaching with her sheep at that very moment. It's easy to look at this and call it a big coincidence, but we know that just like in Genesis chapter 24, this was no coincidence at all. In your lesson this week, you were asked to define the word providence. The definition that I found called divine providence, the governance of God by which he, with wisdom and love, cares for and directs all things in the universe in order to accomplish his will. 
as believers, we know that God is sovereign over all things down to the smallest detail. Jacob arriving at the well at just the right time to meet Rachel was not a happy accident. It was a divine appointment. Just as God led Abraham's servant to Jacob's mother in Genesis 24, God led Jacob to Rachel in verse 9. Jacob's joy and excitement bubbled over and couldn't be contained. He sprung into action, rolled the stone away from the well, and watered his uncle's sheep for Rachel. Jacob demonstrated the same humility and willingness to serve that his mother had all those years before. Jacob was overcome with emotion as he greeted Rachel. All of the loneliness and homesickness melted away as he connected with a family member for the first time in many days. God's providential wisdom led Jacob to the right place at just the right time to find the right person. Our truth is that God in perfect wisdom leads us to accomplish his purposes. See if I can get this to pull up for you. God in perfect wisdom leads us to accomplish his purposes. When Jacob was forced to leave his home in Beersheba, he knew that his job was to locate a wife from his mother's family in Haran. He did not know how easy it would be to find his family, if he would be welcomed by them, or what challenges he would face along the way. He traveled alone and without the luxuries of home that he was accustomed to. Even after an, an encounter with God, Jacob was not given complete understanding of the path moving forward. He was given a promise that God would be with him throughout his journey. Jacob took the next step of faith and trusted that promise from God. We see that God not only led Jacob where he needed to be, but that he also grew Jacob's character throughout the journey. Jacob had a lot of time to think about his future as he traveled from Bethel to Haran. During that journey, we see Jacob grow from a selfish, impatient, greedy young man into a bold and humble man as he followed God's direction. Is there an area in your life where you clearly know what God has asked you to do, but you're still hesitating. What small first step can you take so you will be able to discern the next step? There are times when God's leading is clear and certain. When peace follows our decisions and everything seems to fall into place. It is in these times that God graciously allows us to practice our obedience to him as he leads. One step in front of the other, not turning to the right or to the left, walking where he leads and doing the next right thing as he presents it to us. Now, not only do we see God's wisdom and providence, we also see that God's wisdom is transformative. Jacob lived with Laban for a month. When Laban said to him in verse 15, just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. This seemed like a fair and reasonable, reasonable offer from Laban. However, Laban was aware of the wealth of Jacob's family. He also knew that Jacob sought a wife, but had arrived with nothing to pay a dowry. Laban's manipulation began with this offer. He capitalized on Jacob's desperate state and took advantage of his lack of options. At this point in the passage, the story switches from a narrative and some commentary is added into the story. Whenever you're reading stories in scripture, if you notice interjections of commentary in the story, pay attention to them because they're trying to reveal something to teach you or to prepare you for something that's coming ahead in the story. The commentary in this case, beginning in verse 16, informs us 
that Laban had two daughters. Two? Up to this point, we believe Jacob's search for a maid is complete, but having two daughters complicates things. And as the commentary continues, we find out that not only did Laban have two daughters, Rachel is the younger daughter. This was important in the family dynamics of the day. We're also given this piece of information. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. We do not exactly know what the term weak eyes means. It could mean that Leah had poor eyesight or that her eyes lacked a vibrant sparkle that was prized in the culture. Even lacking complete understanding of what the writer meant by weak eyes, we can clearly understand the direct comparison between Leah and Rachel. In one sister, you have weak eyes, while in the other, you have a lovely figure and beautiful. Further, the writer makes it clear in verse 18 that Jacob was in love with Rachel. Our story goes back to narrative form at this point. And Jacob said to Laban that he would work for seven years to marry Rachel. Jacob knew that he had no money for a dowry. So in order to marry her, he had to come up with an alternative method of payment. Jacob clearly saw Rachel as worth great value as seven years worth of work far exceeded an acceptable dowry amount. Laban quickly agreed to the terms and Jacob patiently served Laban for seven difficult years. The work was not easy and seven years is a long time. But Jacob's great love for Rachel caused the time to pass by quickly. Jacob was so passionate and desired Rachel so deeply that seven years seemed but a day. We also see how God developed Jacob's character through the waiting. Jacob demonstrated self-sacrificing love for Rachel, which completely con contrasts the self-serving nature of his relationships with Isaac and Esau. At the end of seven years, Jacob went to Laban, ready to take Rachel as his wife. Unfortunately, Laban's mani manipulative and cunning nature are displayed in an act of deception that brought pain and suffering to the lives of so many. Laban prepared a feast attended by many friends and neighbors. Now the term feast suggested a meal with no shortage of alcohol. Jacob celebrated his upcoming marriage and enjoyed the wine to the point that he likely did not have control of his faculties on his wedding night. It was also customary that the bride was heavily veiled and would not have seen her husband until the feasting was over, which would have been well into dark. So at the end of the evening, when Laban took Leah to Jacob instead of Rachel, we can understand how Jacob did not notice the switch. We do not really know what part Leah played in the deception. What we do know is that Laban was her father, the head of the household, and she was expected to obey and submit to his commands. Laban may have told Leah that he had already cleared it with Jacob. Leah may have been a willing accomplice who acted based on her emotions, feelings of loneliness, and desire for husband and children. Either way, the ultimate responsibility to rightly fulfill the agreement with Jacob fell to Laban. But rather than do the right thing, Laban set aside the suffering and shame of his own daughters in order to serve himself. Verse 25 says it all. When morning came, there was Leah. Jacob woke up and realized that he had been tricked. He was furious. Jacob kept his end of the deal and worked tirelessly for Laban for seven years in order to marry Rachel. He confronted Laban and asked him, what is this you have done to me? Why have you deceived me? Laban knew he was in the wrong 
but he took no responsibility for his actions. Instead, he defended his behavior by saying that it was not customary to marry the younger daughter before the older. The story that we studied in chapter 27 bears striking similarities to this story. In chapter 27, the privileges of two brothers were exchanged through deception. Here, two sisters were exchanged through deception. Jacob claimed to be Esau in 27. Here, Leah pretended to be her sister. The first was the design of a mother. Here, it was by the father. In the first, the deception was in broad daylight, but to blinded eyes. Here, it is in the night caused by the blindness of too much partying. When I read this story, it makes me angry and sad for Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. But Jacob's anger was restrained as he responded to Laban. He did not demand that Laban make it right. He did not refuse to fulfill his obligation to Leah. He instead agreed to Laban's terms to work another seven years in return for Rachel. How did Jacob so willingly accept Laban's explanation and promise? In that moment, maybe Jacob thought back to his own deceit and treachery against his aged father. He recognized God's discipline in his current situation. He realized the suffering he had caused now that he was the victim of deceit. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that God in his grace forgives our sins when we confess them. However, our sins do not come without consequences or discipline. Proverbs 3, 11 through 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resist his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father of the son he delights in. God, in his wisdom, used this specific situation to discipline, grow, and teach Jacob. Jacob learned to submit to God's loving hand of discipline and was transformed in faith and character. Jacob completed the bridal week with Leah, and then Laban gave Jacob Rachel to be his wife. Laban made two gains by his deception. First, he ensured that both daughters would marry. And second, he gained another seven years of free labor. While his decision seemed beneficial to himself and his family, Laban brought on tremendous pain and suffering to his daughters and son-in-law. Leah suffered as the unloved wife, constantly seeking affection from a husband in love with another woman. Rachel suffered as she watched her husband shared his attention with not just another woman, but her own sister. And Jacob suffered the consequences of being in plural marriage. There was no written law against bigamy at the time, although monogamy was God's plan in creation. Nevertheless, we see the confusion and humiliation of such a household because of favoritism. It's also important to remember that just because a story is in the Bible does not mean that God approves of the behavior or the decisions around incidents. God in his wisdom uses imperfect people and twisted circumstances to bring his pur purposes to perfect fruition. So our truth for this division is that God in his perfect wisdom knows how to mature us through trials. God in his perfect wisdom knows how to mature us through trials. Jacob and Rachel waited seven long years to be married only to be tri tricked by a trusted family member. This led to seven more years of waiting to start their own lives and possibly return to the promised land. During this time, God developed and grew their character, increased their trust in him, and prepared their hearts for what was ahead. How do you respond in the waiting? There are many times in our lives 
when God wants us to wait. A prayer goes unanswered for weeks, months, even years. We seek God's will in a situation, but he remains silent. Do these moments test your patience to wait on God? Do they test your faith in God to answer your prayers? It is easy to become discouraged, overwhelmed, confused, frustrated, even angry with God in these times. But if we can remember who God is in these moments, we can find peace in the waiting. Our all wise God may be silent, but that does not mean that he is not working or that he is absent from our lives. He is near. He is preparing you, changing your heart, drawing you to him so that your faith and trust are in him alone. He sees you, hears your cries, and knows your hurt. As we move to verse 31, we see that truth in our last division, God's compassionate wisdom. It says, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. When we see God respond to Leah in this story, we understand that God is deeply sensitive to our suffering. God saw Leah's hurt and responded by allowing her to conceive. God empathizes with the mental, mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual suffering that we face. God changed Leah's outward and physical circumstances by giving her son after son. But the more important change that God made was to Leah's heart. With each son, we see that Leah grew in her faith and trust in God. Leah's first son was born and she named him Reuben, meaning see a son. She recognized that the blessing of a child was from the Lord and she hoped that with the birth of this firstborn, her husband would love her. Apparently, the birth of a son did not change Jacob's heart. Leah conceived again, and when she gave birth, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. And she named her second son Simeon, which means he hears. Leah again demonstrated faith that God heard her cries. Then son number three, Levi, comes along. Leah longed for her husband to be attached to her. Her focus and desire was to have a husband who loved her. And with the birth of each son, she waited for Jacob's heart to change. What she did not realize was that God was changing her heart. When her fourth son came along, she named him Judah. This time I will praise the Lord. Leah realized that all the years she suffered and waited for her husband to love her, God was showing his love to her. It took her a while to understand what she was seeing in her pain, in her hurting, because she was looking for something different. She wanted Jacob's love, and God said, I have something different and better. I'm going to shower you with my love. With the birth of Judah, Leah turned from false hope to find her security and love in the Lord. Leah was like a lot of people. She desperately wanted a loving mate. And though she did not find one, she sent, found something greater. God's wisdom revealed the empty things that Leah was seeking to satisfy herself. And he continues to graciously uncover idols in our own lives. In the midst of our suffering, the question always arises, is God's love enough? When everything else falls away, is the love of our creator enough to satisfy our deepest desires and strengthen us to face our most pressing insecurities? Our truth is this, God in perfect wisdom knows how to comfort us in suffering. God in perfect wisdom knows how to comfort us in suffering. When we are hurting, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. 
He alone can comfort and meet our every need. When we're suffering, he doesn't waste a moment of that suffering. When we cannot understand what God is at work doing, God assures us he is working out all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Where can you praise God during a season of suffering? Reflect on the times when he has guided you, walked with you, transformed you, and comforted you, and offer praise to him. St. Augustine has a quote that says, God had one son on earth without sin, but never one without suffering. Believers today can look to the example of Jesus Christ as we endure suffering. Jesus went through the whole human experience as he humbled himself and became a man. Jesus has experienced all life's pain from the most trivial irritations to the worst horrors of life. I'm going to read to you from Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by mankind a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the Lord, the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. God takes our suffering so seriously that he himself was willing to suffer on our behalf. Today marks the beginning of the season of Lent. I encourage you to stop and consider the sufferings of our Savior and his obedience. Let us be challenged to walk well in our own sufferings as we learn dependency upon the Father and allow him to comfort us in our deepest needs. Let us pray. Father, we worship you as the all-wise God who uses our suffering to transform us, to grow us, and to mature us who knows what suffering feels like because you have experienced suffering and who comforts us when we are suffering. God, we are just so grateful for the example that we have in Jesus and how we can look to him and hold fast to hope that one day all suffering will go away, that all will be made right and that we will be with you, without suffering, without pain, without grief, without loss. Lord, we love you, we honor you, and we glorify you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.